Hi, my name is Johan. And my name is Matthias. We're honored to have this opportunity to talk about our work, some of the innovation projects that we've launched, and our perspective on prototyping. We believe prototyping is at the core of succeeding with innovation. It provides you with opportunity to get intel early on and helps shape the results to better correspond to the need of the user. And we will start with a short intro of the projects and then move over to discussing key takeaways and insights. Hopefully pinpointing how we prototype ideas. The Natalia project was launched in 2013 as the world's first assault alarm system, protecting human rights defenders at risk. It was an innovation that connected victims to the world, allowing for human rights defenders to be protected using the power of social media. We created the Natalia project together with civil rights defenders, an organization dedicated to protecting human rights defenders at risk, living under threat from some of the world's most oppressive regimes. The goal was to move from a brand promise to creating a very tangible tool, realizing their commitment towards protecting human rights defenders all over the world. We had a, a really great process in, in, in terms of establishing uh, you know, the strategic insights. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, working with the client on understanding the brand promise and the long-term uh, strategic uh, direction they want to take. So uh, honestly, I think that um, uh, we realized uh, that there was room for a more tangible uh, idea and solution. They were open to, uh, to finding a, a innovation that would prove their commitment and also their presence in, in these countries. I think the strategic work that we did uh, which is what we usually call staying with the problem, was uh, uh, you know, key to actually coming up with the idea. Yeah, and their focus was to both protect individual human rights defenders at risk, being teachers, lawyers and anyone else working uh, to stand up for human rights in that geography. And they wanted to do that as well as encouraging and empowering uh, local organizations. So it was both supporting the team as well as protecting the individual. Yeah. But I also think that uh, if you think you have an idea, field test, field test, field test, especially if you're dealing with protecting the life of, of uh, people. I think there was also quite a moving uh, occasion when we were distributing the first bracelets to human rights defenders at risk. And the first one stepped up and said, I love this idea, it's fantastic. It would make me feel more safe. It would make my family know where I am and if something happens to me. But I think my colleague should have it instead. And then you realize just how committed they are to standing up for human rights, protecting their cause and caring for each other. And I, I think that going back to, to uh, prototyping, uh, we felt that uh, the concept was really strong uh, and the second we got this uh, re response from, from actual human rights defenders, uh, kind of giving their blessing uh, on this very, very tangible, very um, uh, creative concept, uh, we were uh, confident in, in developing it. I think uh, we, uh, we tend to launch early, we tend to uh, present ideas um, early on and, and there's a risk in that but at the same time I think uh, with this project it, it wouldn't happen unless uh, we had the support from a lot of people, a lot of organizations all around the world basically signing off on the concept itself that gave us the energy to develop it and, and, and launch it fully. I'm very happy and proud to see that it today protects a lot of people in many parts of the world and there is birds reinforcing that. After the launch of the Natalia project, we had a request from one of our key clients, the Bank of Åland. They wanted us to set up an innovation lab exploring new ideas connected to their long-standing commitment towards saving and protecting the Baltic Sea. Very much inspired from the recent success of the Natalia project, we wanted to create something tangible and concrete, a real tool 
that could be part of a solution to a problem. Due to a very open and eager client, we had the opportunity to explore some very new ways for a bank to connect their service to a greater purpose. And early on, we focused on the credit card. We realized that all of us perceived the credit card to be something we considered to be a symbol of mindless consumption. We also noticed how credit card companies and payment services all wanted to speed up consumption even more at the time. So, the idea of the world's first credit card to measure the environmental impact of each transaction was born. I think early on we wanted to attach the idea and the ability to drive sustainable change to a vehicle that was used every day. Something that you could connect to, something that you respected, and something that could educate you around your, um, the impact of your daily lifestyle choices. And um, boom, there was the credit card. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think honestly, uh, it was that sense of, of uh, uh, getting inside people's wallets in a way. It was so unlikely for us to think that the credit card could uh, be the tool to increase responsibility and awareness that almost made us focus even more on, on, on finding a solution around the credit card. I think this project was also a project where collaboration was at core, where we had great support from leading expertise within uh, providing impact data to make the calculations uh, precise and credible, working with leading consultancy firms in regard of vetting the methodology, and also working together with MasterCard actually, uh, having them approve a, a card design that helped accelerate the message. Mm. And uh, I must say that the bank was pretty brave saying, this is the card, it's going to replace all other credit cards in the bank, there's one card for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, the key is the client here. Yeah. Simultaneously, with all an index, yet another project was created. As much an innovation for good as a business model innovation, providing value by giving away the ability to activate creativity by everyone else. Humanium aimed amongst many other things to solve a much needed update of traditional fundraising, disrupting the perspective on value creation and inviting new stakeholders to the table. The key to coming up with the idea of launching the world's most valuable metal came from focusing on the problem for a great period of time. We understood that attaining the metal was the real challenge, not creating the products. In short, making the metal available for commercial production. This also meant facilitating the creativity of others to create value. Humanium turns the leftover metal from weapons destruction programs into a currency for good, funding much needed development projects, supporting victims of armed violence. And it took us well over two years to build a scalable business model to ensure commercial distribution. This, this bar is uh, 3.8 kilos. So I think this is one of the first uh, bars we, we made. Uh, so 3.8 kilos is what, what's left over from an AK-47. To me, the way that germanium as a project and, and as a metal challenges the traditional donation model uh, is quite a few different ways actually. But I think looking at it as a brilliant example for open innovation is at core. Open innovation in the sense that anyone can step up, make use of the material and use their creativity to bring it to life, to bring it into a revenue stream representing something else than traditional donations. Bring it in, into usage of people representing knowledge and insights compared to traditional communication around illegal firearms and all the pain it renders. So, Humanium as an open innovation platform, more than a metal, makes perfect sense to me. And I think when I see the different products coming out today, being produced out of Humanium, it strikes a chord every time. Because you know where that metal has been and what the purpose of that metal was. 
and now it's been completely redirected and it has generated funds to redirect that purpose even more. In 2018, we started Economy, a company that aims to provide digital solutions for what we call everyday climate action. A company built on the drive to address the greatest challenge of mankind today, the climate crisis. In a way, the economy is about rewiring the financial systems to help redirect individuals' own financial power towards a more sustainable future. We aim to educate individuals in the understanding of their impact on the planet and help them reduce their footprint. Do Black was our way of creating a product that showed a person's commitment to reducing their carbon footprint in a very radical way by putting a limit to their spending based on their carbon emissions linked to their consumption. It was a premium card, but where the premium was really about reinforcing the cardholder's level of commitment. Powered by your own consumption habits, connected to the 2030 targets outlined in the IPCC report, uh, reducing CO2 emissions with 50% per person in the coming 10 years. The relevance of the set limit propelled the understanding of our impact forward. Insights much needed to educate and engage around conscious consumption. Do Black counts and calculates your every transaction and per se makes every transaction count. The idea is actually not as much about stopping people from consuming as it is to make them start understanding. Why would anyone be interested in a card that caps your spending, that puts a limit on your spending with uh, respect for another factor than financial, in this case, carbon emissions? I think that's one of the key questions we asked ourselves in prototyping this innovation leading up to the patented solution that we now have in place. A key insight uh, uh, for the economy, but also uh, uh, part of the idea behind Do Black is obviously that 60% of a person's individual carbon footprint is linked to their consumption. And that's very important. It means that you could actually influence the 60% of your carbon footprint. You can reduce it, you can start understanding um, ways to, to uh, mitigate your, your impact. The only thing more extreme than using Do Black is to not use it. Mm. Because if you're looking at what's at stake, Do Black is a really tangible tool in mitigating that risk when it comes to the climate crisis. And doing nothing at all is a by far greater risk than having your spending capped at a preset limit. There is today an obvious disconnect between producers and consumers. The consumers are increasingly more interested in the effects of their everyday lifestyle choices manifested by consumption. They're asking simple questions. What is the true cost of my purchase? Is there potentially an alternative with a lower impact? And most brands today can only respond, well, it depends. This, the 2030 calculator, aim to change to empower both brands and consumers, and to bridge that very disconnect. Realizing that small and medium-sized brands wanted to calculate the carbon footprint of their products but simply lacked the means was at the core of this innovation. There was a clear sense of a blind spot. We researched existing methods and realized that there was a drastically more simple way to do it, cutting down not only on the time required but most importantly on the cost. A free, easy-to-use product carbon footprint calculator is a way to completely democratize the ability for brands to carbon label their products, which is to us the very first step towards ensuring both responsible consumption and sustainable production. I think when we started working on the 2030 calculator, um, we realized that uh, there's a clear sense of creating a standard um, in the end, it's about comparing products and, and the ability for brands to use the same kind of method uh, in calculating uh, the carbon footprint of their products. So uh, the end game is really to create a collaborative platform where brands can uh, support and, uh, and also uh, uh, contribute with data so that more brands are able to, to uh, make calculations based on the same data. 
So uh, we think this platform has the potential of being a part of setting a standard of how to calculate the product carbon footprint of, of products. The 2030 calculator um, enables a few different things. But the first, we need to understand that the data already exists, the consumers already exist, and the brands already exist. So the 2030 calculator being more of a collaboration platform can enable many good things. A, comparability, uh, so that brands actually compete uh, in, on the same playing field. And B, uh, enabling carbon labeling. If there is carbon labels on every product calculated in the same way, using the same data, as well as the same methodology, that would turn sustainability into a competitive edge. Right now there's brands out there that has ensured sustainable production but have, have no means of actually proving that. And this, this uh, sense of carbon labeling is, is the way forward. Uh, we need to get to a point where the consumer understands that uh, uh, the difference between impact and also, for that matter, uh, could possibly accept a higher price for a, for a lower impact uh, product, which is extremely important because that's the, that's the dynamics of a market uh, that we need to set that value as being as important as price and quality. Uh, so it, there, there's something um, uh, truly important with, with this project. If people realize that protecting the planet will make them more profits than not protecting the planet, I think this planet will be in greater shape in a shorter period of time. It's uh, like Jean-Paul Sartre said, once you know and are aware, you can choose to do something or you can choose to do nothing, but you're still aware. That's where carbon labeling kicks in at full force.